Hi, this is Dr. Gregory Sadler. I'm a professor of philosophy and the president and founder of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, where we put philosophy into practice. I've studied and taught philosophy for over 20 years, and I find that many people run into difficulties reading classic philosophical texts. Sometimes it's the way things are said or how the text is structured, but the concepts themselves are not always that complicated, and that's where I come in. To help students and lifelong learners, I've been producing longer lecture videos and posting them to YouTube. Many viewers say they find them useful. What you're currently watching is part of a new series of shorter videos, each of them focused on one core concept from an important philosophical text. I hope you find it useful as well. In letter 58, Seneca is devoting the bulk of his discussion to a six-fold classification of being that he says he's getting from Plato, and we have no reason to think that he's not getting it from some sort of Platonic text or teaching, even though it's difficult to find anything like this within the dialogues that we have or, or the letters that, that we have and think are genuine. You might say, well, why is Seneca interested in Plato's classification of being? And he, he gives two reasons for caring about this in this letter, about halfway through after he's talked about um, you know, the, the different classifications and how individual material things are not really beings according to Plato. So he says, what do I have to gain from these fine distinctions of yours? Nothing, if you ask me, but there is actually something just as the engraver tired from a long period of close work turns his eyes away to rest. And as we say, to nurture them. So should we sometimes relax our minds and refresh them with some amusement. Um, and, and he says, you know, this is an amusement. Now, most of us don't consider metaphysics to be particularly a relaxing amusement, but Seneca does because he's been thinking about these things for quite some time. But he also says that there's another moral that you can take from these. He says, I take every thought, no matter how removed from philosophy, and try to extract something from it and turn it to good use. What could be more distant from the sort of things I'm interested in than the matters I explained just now? How can the platonic ideas make me a better person? And he says, well, maybe we can see this. All those things that minister to our senses that entice and arouse us are not accepted by Plato as things that truly exist. Thus, they are figments and present an appearance only for a time. None of them are stable or solid, and yet we desire them as if they were to exist forever and is if we were to possess them forever. And he says, you know, we can, we can use this as Stoics to consider how fleeting all of those, those material things that we're seeking after, and indeed our, our bodies themselves actually are, and that will help us out. Now, early on in the work, he does something that some other Latin writers of his time uh, and before him have also done, which is to apologize for the inadequacy of the Latin language. And he brings up this term essentia, which is coming from the word to be, esse, right, which is a, a verb. And essentia is sort of a substantification of it, a, a way of taking the verb, the be, being, and making it into something like a noun a being or being itself. And we don't have to get too careful about what exactly he means by essentia. This is a term that gets used by, by earlier authors. He mentions Cicero, who doesn't actually use it that much, but there's other authors who do in fact use it. And then it, it, you know, throughout um, the Latin West's uh, later philosophy and well into the Middle Ages, essentia becomes a very common term to use actually goes into modern philosophy as well, so long as modern philosophy is being written in Latin, like, say, what Descartes and Hobbes did, right? So this term essentia gets used, and he, he says that I'm trying to use this to capture something of the Greek ousia, which is often translated as substance. It's a term that we see it, you know, running throughout Greek philosophy. And again, there's a lot of different ways of understanding what ousia means. 
But, you know, think about it as like the, 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 the bedrock ontologically of stuff. And he, and he talks about this. He says, here we go. Um, There's no way I can express in Latin the concept that induced me to take our language to task. You'll object to our Rome limitations even more than I do when you learn that the word I'm incapable of rendering is just one syllable. Uh, we're going we're to come to that. Before that, he says, how will I render usia? For that is a necessary item, nature that comprises the basis of all things. So I'm asking your permission to use this word essentia to, to render it. Now, the other term that he brings up is even wider in scope, the Greek toon. And he says, oh, man, I'm not happy with myself because I have to render this, this particular you know, word, which is a noun, the to means the or or you know it's, it's sort of a, a it's a it's a pre, it's, it's something we use to designate the thing that is being right the thing that's in the process of being whatever how we're gonna we're gonna call it in latin it's quod est quod uh that which and then est is so Cicero, or not Cicero, Seneca is not entirely happy about the translation here. But the, the idea is what is, what has being, what exists. So before he goes into discussing Plato, he just mentions that Plato has a six-fold way of understanding this. He says, let's consider uh, genuses or genera is the proper way. I'm talking about it and species. And he says... Um, I must state there is such a thing as a genus and a species. At present, we're looking for that primary genus on which all the remaining species depend, from which arises every division, in which all things are included. So what is the most encompassing genus, the bag that you can put everything else into? So, you know, first of all, what are you know, genus and species? Think about individuals. Got this tie or this human being in front of you, right? Or this piece of chalk. Now, that is an individual, a particular, and it falls under a certain kind of species. So I fall under the species of human being. This tie fi falls under the species ties, and not the species articles of clothing or accessories. That's a higher organizational thing, a, a bigger class that is what here we're calling a genus. And where it gets a little confusing, particularly if you, if you think about you know, how we organize animals, is that there, it isn't just species, genus, and then everything above it. All those other things above it, those other classes, those are also genuses or genera. So we're looking for the one that actually encompasses the most. And, and we can do this by a process of sort of climbing to it. So we can start with, well, let's say human being, right? As a species, horse is a species, dog is a species. What's shared between them? Animate creature. Now we have a, a, a genus. And then we can say, okay, some things are, are living, they're animate. Some things are not animate. So we can say um, we have living things, animals and plants are in that. And then we have rocks and bodies being added to it. And we have this genus of bodies. And then we can say, well, is there something higher than body? Yes, yeah, some things are corporeal, bodily. Other things are incorporeal. So we're getting closer and closer to this, this encompassing genus, as he says. And he says, the Stoics that which is the generic genus has nothing above it. It's the beginning of all things, all others are subordinate. But he says the Stoics want to place above this yet another still more primary genus as well. So he's going to come to that in a bit. And that, that's ultimately going to be, you know, God. Then he talks about the real centerpiece of this letter, which is Plato's sixfold division. And again, I want to remind you, this is not coming from any one of the Platonic dialogues as far as we can tell. So he says, the first of things that are is, he says, not apprehended by sight or touch or any sense. It is the thinkable, that which is by genus. For example, the generic human does not present itself to the eye, but the specific does, such as Cicero and Cato, right? Animate creature is not seen, it is thought, and what one sees are its species, horse and dog. So the genuses themselves have a certain kind of being. 
They are something that is. And we might say, well, yeah, they, they, I guess you could say they have being. They're being in the, in the way that they are in our minds or something. And this is something where the ancients are a bit more willing to say, no, there's, there's something out there. It's not something you can actually touch or, or smell or grab a hold of or see with your eyes, but you can grasp it with your mind. So that's the first one. Then he talks about something really interesting, what exceeds and surpasses all other things, right? And this is the second of things that, that have being. And he says, this is preeminent being. And he says, the word poet is used commonly since this is the name for all who make verses. But among the Greeks, it is by now come to refer only to one. When you hear poet, you understand Homer. If you're a Thomas Aquinas, you talk about the philosopher, you mean Aristotle, right? So what is this being? Now, this is where it gets really interesting, right? Because for Plato, if we were going to say, well, what is this? It's the form of the good or the form of the beautiful. The beautiful as such, the good as such. It's not God because the gods themselves are kind of lesser than that. But... From the Stoic perspective, he says, obviously, this is God, since it's greater and more powerful than anything else. And God is understood as the divine reason governing the entire universe that is there, even when the universe burns up in the universal conflagration and then comes back together. So that's the second class of being. Then we start to get some stuff that we recognize a little bit more closely from Plato. The ideas. The, what we often call the platonic forms. But here we want to avoid the word form because Seneca is going to use it in a different, much more Aristotelian way. The ideas, the things that are immortal, eternal, and unchanging. He talks about them as being models, and that fits the platonic ideas of them being paradigma, the things that we model things after. And he says that uh, everything that we see comes into being, everything is shaped in accordance with them. As for what an idea is or what Plato thinks an idea is, listen, an idea is the eternal model of those things which come naturally into being. And then he says to this, I will add some interpretation so as to make the subject plainer to you. Here is where Seneca is deviating considerably from Plato. He says, okay, I want to make a portrait of you. I have, a, as a model for the, I have used a model for the picture from that model. My mind receives a certain configuration to impart to its work. You're the idea in that case. And he says, here's where it gets very non-Platonic. The world's nature includes countless models of this sort. Now, that, was, that by itself is not non-Platonic. Here's where it, it, it actually becomes so. Models of human beings, of the various fishes and trees, all things that must come into being by nature's agency are formed according to these models. Now, where is the plural coming in? That's that, that you know, if, if there's any plurality in these, these models, um, you know, where we would have more than one model of a human being, then we got a problem, right? So he doesn't actually, you know, discuss that further because he's interested in, in, in these being things that, again, we grasp just through the, the mind. Then we have the eidos or the form, and this is much more Aristotelian in the sense that the form is in the thing. So the form of the tie is the structure of this piece of cloth, right? And if, if this cloth was arranged in a different way, it might be a handkerchief or a blanket or who knows what else, a napkin holder, right? If all this stuff that comprises my body were arranged in slightly different ways, I would not be a human being. I would be medical waste or a corpse or whatever we're going to talk about because things wouldn't be lined up properly, right? So that has being as well, he says. And then the form itself, think about like a statue, right? When you impart form to the material of the statue, it's going from being a block of marble to being a, a David, right? Or it's going from being bronze that's you know, now being poured and shaped into being an archer or uh, I don't know, whatever else you want it to be. Another thing that he talks about, the fifth thing, he says, things that exist commonly, and in the Latin for this is quae communiter sunt, 
And the examples that he give here, gives here are kind of interesting. He says, um, this includes everything, omnia, right? All things, people, farm animals, things. You might say, well, these are sort of generic themselves, aren't they? Yes and no. You know, he sees a distinction here between the, the generic things and the things that are spoken or you might say designated commonly. And then there's things that we can translate in English as kind of exist. Don't really exist, but kind of exist. He says quasi sunt. And what are these sorts of things? The void, time. They, they have being, but they don't really have being. But they, they are. And so, you know, how do we describe these? Now, what's been left out? Here's where it gets really interesting. Well, human beings as individual human beings, or really anything that we can touch, smell, hear, individual material things. He says, everything we see or touch is excluded by Plato from those things which are on his view, which on his view are in the strict sense. Why? Because they are in flux and constantly decreasing and increasing. No one of us is the same in old age as he was in youth. Not one of us is the same in the morning as he was the day before. We're in constant change. Our bodies are carried away like rushing streams. And then he says, um, this is what Heraclitus, the great pre-Socratic philosopher, means when he says, we step into the same river twice and not at all. The name of the river remains the same. The water has passed on. And he says, this is more evident in a river than in a human being, but a current sweeps us along as well, and it's no less swift. So with a river, it's easy to tell that it's not the same river because it's constantly in flux, and we just assign a certain name to it. But the waters actually have moved on. It's not so easy with us where our cells are, you know, slowly dying and being replaced and things are changing all of the time. And so, you know, Seneca is willing to say that according to Plato, those things don't really exist. They appear, they present themselves in a way, but what's presenting itself is constantly changing. This stuff, these other six divisions of to'on, of quod est, what has being, what is, what exists. Those are the things that really are. And so that's what we should be more focused on, according to Plato. And Seneca himself is willing to say, yeah, there's, there's something to that idea. We can get something out of this.